duties today, the one thing he wanted to remind me was that one of my jobs is to make Pastor Brad look good. I told him no worries because when I was done, you would hug Pastor Brad when you next saw him. <laughs> but I'm also mindful that uh, I do appreciate your allowing me to come and visit with you and to share with you. And I'm thankful for the opportunity. And when uh, doing pulpit supply, I always remember the admonition of 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because the one thing I'm sure of, there's a special punishment for those to stand in God's pulpit and intentionally pervert his word. So let's begin by opening with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for those that, that have gathered here at uh, 122 Church Road, the Carson Valley Church of the Brethren. Uh, I'm sure that the congregation is not happy that their pastor is not with them today. But God, direct us. Help, help us, Father, to, to hear your word and to bring that into our world. Whether we be here or at our place of employment or Canoe Creek. We thank you for this day. We thank you for every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about suffering and how we and God respond to that. It's a dark time in our nation, uh, but I'm convinced that it's in the heart of every man and woman to want to worship something. And I, be I believe we do worship something. We either worship the dollar we worship uh, love of the world, we worship something, or we worship Jesus Christ. And I think at this time, as dark as things are, that one of the good things that come out of this is people are searching, people want to know, people have questions, and they're relying on you to help them to find that truth and to help them to see the love of Christ. So today... It, I don't care whether you're saved or unsaved, man or woman, boy or girl, young or old, we all petition or pray to the Lord. And we do this especially when we're in trouble. Uh, and when trouble comes our way, whether it's ourselves or family or friends, uh, someone we know or someone we've heard about, someone that just comes onto our radar, we petition God. We uh, reach out in prayer be they spiritual, emotional, or physical troubles, we seek God's healing, we seek God's comfort, and we seek, seek God's direction. We expect answers to our prayer. Do we expect healing or positive answers to our prayer? And when do we expect the answer? A lot of times, we think that it's, it's like magic. We rub the, the lantern and God's gonna appear and respond to our wishes. Right? Uh, it's not the way it works. Many of us grew up learning events from the Bible. Notice that I don't say stories uh, because I'm painfully aware because I misused the word one time and someone got something else out of it. So when people say stories, I don't have a problem with that. I can talk about stories from the Bible and to me that's the same thing as saying events. But this person was saying stories as if you tell stories to your kids, right? It's made up, it's make-believe, it's not real, it's not history. And I would tell you that this is his story, this is history. You can believe this, you can count on it, you can trust it. It's as relevant today as it was in the first century. And I would also tell you that when we ask for a miracle, when we pray, uh, we aren't necessarily pulled from the hardship. And we aren't Im immediately healed. Look at Paul. Paul suffered a thorn in his side to his death, right? So sometimes we, we aren't pulled from the misery, whatever we're praying for. In fact, sometimes things get worse. That's why we don't tell people in, in mental health circles when we're talking to someone that's suffered a loss, don't worry, things will get better. 
things may not get better. Things may get worse. We don't have any control over that. We shouldn't lie to people, right? But God often joins us in our trials. And that's what I would tell you, that he is, the times that I've been sickly, the times I've faced surgery, he's been there with me. But he doesn't necessarily take them away. He might. It does happen. Uh, and people are miraculously cured of cancer and diabetes and all those kinds of things. It does happen. Do I have an answer for it? No. Do I think God's in a lot of it? Yes. But if you look at the, if God's word, Job, if you read the book of Job, and I love that book, he lost everything he knew. If you look in Job 1, 2, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath, all that he hath, all that he possesses is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. In other words, Satan was given dominion over Job, but existent, except his person. So Satan went away from the presence of the Lord, right? And he did his dirty deed with Job. Because uh, what, what his statement was to the Lord was, if you don't think Job only worships you because of the things that you've done for him, take away those things, and you'll see how Job turns on you. He didn't. In fact, to his, I mean, his own wife came out and said, why don't you, things are bad, why don't you just lay down and die? He didn't. He said, God is my God, and I'll continue to worship him. If we look at Daniel, Daniel was left in the lion's den, Daniel 6.16. Then the king commanded that they brought forth Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Now, do I know what was in his mind? Was he being sarcastic? Was it a test? Did he kind of half believe that God would save Daniel? So the den was shut. He was left in there for time. And the lion's mouths were shut, right? And Daniel came forth. If we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it's an old, there's an old joke about what that stands, the translation, I'm not going to go there. Um, we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were left in the fiery furnace. Daniel 3.21 tells us that these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. And they were left there for a time. And the king said, didn't we throw three people in? Why am I seeing four? Because God was in there with them. He didn't remove them from that furnace right away, right? If we look at Lazarus, Lazarus died from his illness, John eleven twenty one, 21. And Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died, right? You got to wonder what, what her frame of per, or perspective was at that moment in time, right? Um, of course, Jesus went and called him forth, right? But he still died. So what was done was temporary. And uh, Jesus, Jesus was left on the cross also. He spent hours on the cross in agony and torment. Uh, Matthew 27, 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there's, you could talk for an hour and a half on just that alone, but suffice to say that it seemed like an eternity because he was separated from God. God had turned his back on him because God could not look on sin. Commonly, we ask, or pray for deliverance, or for healing, a miracle. I think it's safe to say that we've often found that God did not pull us from the struggle. There have been people, I'm sure in this church, especially as you get older, that have had strokes, that have had cancer of one form or another. We say cancer like it's one thing, but 
Cancer can be a wide variety of things affecting different parts of the body or the entire body. Um, there, there are so many other illnesses that I, I, I'm sure the people here have suffered. But God didn't pull us from the struggle, but that sometimes things actually worsen. Things may have happened which left us wondering if God really existed or perhaps heard our cries for intervention. The bottom line is that we questioned. We questioned everything. I was recently talking to a middle-aged lady, a young lady, that uh, had lost her husband. And she wanted to know why God did this to her. Now, it was in my heart to spit out several platitudes, right? She wasn't in the mood to hear them. You know, uh, the wound was still fresh, but she needed to hear how much Jesus loved her, how much Jesus loved her husband, and how, for some reason, her husband, that I don't know, her husband was taken home. Uh, I believe they are both Christians, which sometimes I wonder, well, as a Christian, why are you questioning God about that? Don't you realize that it's all about his glory? What? I have to bite my own tongue and realize they're going through a time of questioning, a time of trauma. They're trying to resolve the hurt with the reality. So... This is particularly true if we don't have a biblical view of the world. I like to think that I do have a biblical view of the world, that everything is fed through that filter, fed through the focus of God's word. If you don't have that view, then everything changes from day to day. There can be no continuity. We should use the Bible as our lens, our filter, to see the world and all things through. God's word is true, God's word is relevant, God's word is trustworthy. Always has been, always will. We, in this world, people like to tell you that truth is relevant, right? Depends. Tomorrow's truth might be different than this. You have your truth and I have my truth. There's something wrong with that mode of thought. God's word is true, right? Uh, in John 16, 32, 33, we read, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in, in me ye might have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So if you're a Christian, you know that this that you can see is temporary. That that you cannot see is eternal. And we don't need to worry about tomorrow because God is there. God is in the past and the future. He's here with us today. God is with us in our misery. If we turn to him, we'll see that peace. We'll experience that peace. The truth is that all things are for the glory of God. It is not about us, it's not about me. You know, not a day goes by that it's about me. It's about my being the hands and feet of Christ and about loving others. And that's what Jesus was about. Jesus talked more about love, I think, than, than anything else because God is love. It's about the one God the triune God, and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I was so happy to see the music here. Uh, I've gone to churches where they play music, and then the uh, song leader stands up and says, how y'all feeling? Well, don't care. You know, personally, I might say, how are you feeling today? You were sick last week. How are you feeling? But when it comes to God's word, it's not a matter of how we feel. It's a matter of what God's word says to us. It's a matter of what God's word says, right? So, I mean, first, 
God's word is about salvation, right? We, we need to be saved. And I, I hope that I'm talking to a room full of folks that have accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Number two, I would tell you that after salvation, continually to the day we die, does Jesus have first place in my heart? Am I concerned with Christ all day, every day? Right? Because that's, that's where we should be. If, there's, if you go two, three days and you don't think about Christ, something's amiss. You need to get right with yourself. You need to get right with God. Something's amiss. And if you just pray to, to the God when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, and you don't think about him in the middle of the day, something's wrong. If it doesn't joy your heart to talk to your friends, to your wife, to your kids, to your mom and dad about Jesus, then again, something's not where it needs to be. Many of you know that I'm a chaplain at the uh, Altoona Hospital, UPMC, and one of the privileges that I have is the opportunity to journey with patients at the Hillman Cancer Center. Typically, throughout the week, I'm in the hospital and I'm journeying with patients there. Uh, but more often than not, I go in and talk to a patient, uh, sh share with them, they share with me, and that might be the only time I ever see them, right? Every patient I see is offered an opportunity for prayer. If they want to pray with me, that's fine. If they would prefer that I pray with them, that's fine. Uh, if, if you've ever prayed with somebody that's Jewish or you talk to people that are Jewish, they just don't want you to pray in Jesus' name. They don't, you can pray about God all day, every day. They don't want to hear you talk about Jesus, right? Um, so it takes a little finessing. There are people that I journey with that profess Christ, right? And you know, as much as a human can know, that they need to receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Uh, because they don't want to hear anything that you have to say, really. But they, they'll tell you they're okay. Well, that, that, in, in the hospital scheme of things, that's fine. On a rare occasion, though, I do have people say to me, tell me about this Jesus that you know. Well, then I definitely draw up a chair because we're going to be a little while, right? I can't spend a day with them, but I can tell them about Christ if they ask. But the difference is when I go to the Hillman Center on Fridays, these are people typically that are receiving radiation or chemotherapy. Some are on a weekly basis, some are on a bi-weekly basis, some are every day, some are every other month for a time period. So all of them have suffered some form of trauma, pretty much like the people in the hospital, but this is a little different. And why is it different? Because for many, the future's unknown, and healing is a real possibility. For some, they're facing eternity, and they know it. And they... Uh, and they know it's coming quickly. Might be, might be a year. That's quickly. Right. And my obligation as a chaplain is to journey with them, to be with them, to help them understand whatever it is they want to understand. Whatever, everything I do at the hospital is permission-based. It's not like a pastor. Like when Brad goes to sit with someone at the hospital, it's someone he knows someone he's expected him and you share so it's probably somebody in his church right so you share foundations so when he's coming to see you he's coming as your pastor when i'm coming to see you i come as the hospital chaplain and my job is not to push my faith on you my job is to be there and to journey or to be with you right and to help you through that day it might be to help you through more, but it's definitely to help you through that day. But it's all permission-based, right? Which is a struggle for me sometimes. So, um, 
and I would tell you that when I go to the Hillman Center, Center and I walk amongst the bays, it's common for me to see a, a friendly smile. Because when they see me, they look forward to our discussions. Because I try, I always try to steer gently to the discussions, to things that are important. I mean, we can talk about how their, their husband's a logger, or how this, this is keeping them out of their job and they're missing work. We can talk about those things, sure. But is it really important? And that's what I want to talk to them about. They may look forward to going home with the Lord or acknowledge the end of life. Generally, I'm going to tell you, these are people that are seekers. Um, they're either going to tell you very quickly that they're going home to be with the Lord and they're going to miss their kids, they're going to miss their uh, wives, they're going to miss their family, right? But I, but I am certain of this. When they die, as much as their family misses them, that they wouldn't come back if they could because they're so blessed and happy to be in the arms of Jesus. So, and if they ask for the meaning of God's word, we can look into that. It's not uncommon that, that people will say to me, hey, uh, somewhere in the Bible it says, uh, uh, a fool says there is no God. <laughs> so, uh, the Bible doesn't say that, that's a lie, right? What does the Bible say? A fool says in his heart, there is no God. There's a big difference between the two. Uh, so if they ask for the meaning of God's word, we can look into that. Whatever their status, saved or unsaved, God loves them. God loves us, despite our temporary condition, right? Everything in God's word is him wanting a relationship with us. He wants to have a personal relationship. He knows you, but he wants you to know him. It's, it's God's word that's important, and you should verify everything you are told by reading his word. Don't take my word for anything. The, the scriptures I've quoted, I hope you'll, you'll read them in here. The things that I've said, I hope you'll, double, you'll fact check me. Do like they do to the uh, presidential candidates, fact check me, right? And if I'm wrong, step to me. Tell me I was wrong. And tell me why I was wrong, because I'm going to want to know. I, I want it right. Um, if Jesus loved, loved and lived for the church enough to give his life for it, then we ought to love the church enough to give our lives to it. This world is fleeting. What, what you can see and feel, it's only temporary. It's hard for us because that's, that's where our existence is. That's our plane of existence, right? But we should look for those things that are spiritual. We should look for eternity. This is going to pass. This is going to pass away. Our lives with Christ is not. And if Jesus went all the way in for the church, then we ought to be all in to the church. Why? Because Jesus loves you, Jesus loves me, and he wants the best for us. And people are going to encounter you. You're going to encounter people that you suspect are lost, and they're going to have questions. And it, shame on you if you don't either have an answer to that question or aren't, aren't able to steer them to someone that does have answers for that question. Uh, one of the companies, independent from the ch chaplain service at the hospital, that I go to weekly, right, they, they, want, they, they, they have a bunch of different beliefs for people that are there, but having said that, They, they do have questions, they want to know. And it's incumbent upon me, at, at being at that company and being representing God, because that's what I do, to have answers for them. If I don't know, I don't know. Let me look that up, you know? Uh, sometimes, it, and they're working, so they don't have the time for me to drag out my Bible and to sit down and have a little Bible study with them. I have maybe five minutes or so with each employee uh, so, and I either have to make my touch then or I have to say I'll see you next week, right? So, um, I thank you very much.